Welcome back. The homesteading era in Saskatchewan seems buried in the distant past, and our ancestors who lived those years have long since been laid to rest. In geological time, however, the intervening century is but the blink of an eye. In 1906, when Ferdinand Lang's plow cut its first furrow, it was turning over prairie sod that had lain undisturbed for 22 million years. Mastodons, giant sloths, giant bears, and proto-horses once roamed these plains. And in recent millennia, they were home to the bison and deer that sustained the indigenous ancestors of the Kainai, Dakota, Salto, and Cree, among others. Then came the Europeans, armed with steel weapons and steeped in a philosophy of conquest. They laid waste to the vast herds of buffalo and overwhelmed and outnumbered the people who had lived here for thousands of years. Those who survived disease and starvation were isolated on reserves. Among these were the reserves that flanked our ancestors' homesteads to the north and east, the Gordon, Daystar, and Poorman reserves today amalgamated into the Kawakatus, the Cree name for poor man or thin man. In 1874, when the Canadian government signed Treaty 4 with the chiefs of the Cree and Salto of southern Saskatchewan, the deal involved not only reserving for these nations 195,000 square kilometers of land, or 75,000 square miles in terms of the day, it also required the federal government to provide families and chiefs with cash payments and some household goods, as well as farming equipment and supplies. We're told that many people started to farm around that time, producing crops and animals for their own consumption. And indeed, there have been indigenous farmers on Kawakatoos ever since. However, the $5 cash payment of 1874 remains $5 to this day, worth a tiny fraction of its purchase power 150 years ago. This remains a contentious issue for many First Nations living under treaties across Canada. The arrival of Europeans was not a surprise to the Cree. Their oral histories had foretold their coming. This would be the first time our family would meet indigenous people, but the Cree and Salto had been dealing with Europeans for decades. All this is by way of partially setting the stage for our extended Lang family's arrival on the plains. When Ferdinand Lang, his son John, and son-in-law Anton Degelman and their families left Winnipeg to claim their free land to the west, their progress tracked the immigration policy established by Prime Minister Laurier and his minister Clifford Sifton, neither of whom spoke German or Ukrainian, nor did many of their civil servants. So, to manage thousands of non-English-speaking immigrants, the government hired fluent intermediaries, and for the German-speaking group that was ours, they found one John Wolfe. Born in Germany in 1856, John Wolfe made his way to Canada in 1876, spent a number of years in New Alsace teaching, farming, and looking to move up in the world. He was avowedly ambitious, and by 1901 he was employed as a clerk with the federal government Department of Immigration in Winnipeg. Fluent in German, he recruited most of what was called the German colony from the congregation of St. Joseph's Catholic Church, across the street from Ferdinand Lang's home on 511 Mountain Avenue. The other Langs and Degelmans were also conveniently nearby. Wolf would have helped facilitate renting the settler cars that homesteaders filled with their wagon, animals, personal effects, and farm equipment for the 300-mile railroad ride to Cupar in the one-year-old province of Saskatchewan. John Wolfe facilitated the settlers from Winnipeg and also from his base at Wolfsheim, literally Wolfe's home, a few hundred meters away from Loon Creek. Established in 1904, Wolfsheim's few buildings sat near the center of Southwest Section 23 in sight of Northeast 15, a quarter I knew well as part of my parents' farm. But wait, what? The Southwest of what the what, you ask? Let me unscramble these terms. 
When the Canadian government set out to survey these territories, their key unit was the square mile, which was one section of a 36-section township. Under Treaty 4, for example, reserves were established for the indigenous people of the area and the formula used was one square mile for every five persons. Each section was then divided into four quarter sections, northwest, northeast, southwest, southeast. Townships are numbered south to north and range lines east to west. So the full address for Wolfsheim was southwest section 23, Township 27, Range 18, west of the second meridian. Aren't you glad you asked? In 1905, the Grand Trunk Railway arrived in Cupar, which a year later was the closest departure point for the Touchwood Hills. And in July 1906, Ferdinand and family disembarked here with their overflowing wagon fitted with metal hoops and a canvas cover for shade and rain that often doubled as a tent. With a team of oxen up front and a cow and a third ox trailing behind, they set out to find and follow the Prince Albert's Trail north to Wolfsheim. At a speed of about two miles per hour, it took three long, uncomfortable days to cover the 50 miles. The weather was hot and dry. By day, they kept an eye on the horizon looking for prairie fires, a terrifying recurring event on the grassy plains. However, as homesteaders cultivated the grasslands, fuel for fires diminished, and within a few decades, prairie fires had all but disappeared. Mosquitoes, however, survived and apparently thrived, as family lore relates their efforts to hold the bloodsuckers at bay with small fires, producing lots of smoke they called smudges. 1906 was a banner year for homesteading, when homesteads had come available in 1903, most were snapped up by speculators, often young men who cobbled together the $10 registration fee and dreamed of making a bundle reselling their claim. Most did not anticipate the brutally hard work involved, and for many, just surviving the harsh winters proved too challenging. And so by 1906, the majority of them failed to qualify for their patent or ownership. You see, the land wasn't exactly free. Once registered, a homesteader had to reside on the land for three years, build a dwelling and outbuildings, and show increasing acreage under cultivation. Failing that, the land reverted to the crown and became available for another homesteader. The Prince Albert Trail led them to Wolfsheim right across a quarter that 25 years later would be part of my family's farm. And had it still existed, Wolfsheim's few buildings would have been visible from the middle of a slough along our fence line, where my brother and I once managed to get our John Deere AR tractor stuck to the axles in the mud. But I digress. We're told that the Walter family hosted the elders for the night, and the next day, probably July 20th, 1906, Ferdinand would have signed the registration documents and followed Wolf's directions to his southwest section 32, about four miles northwest of Wolfsheim. But first, they would have veered a bit south and stopped at Southeast 20, where Ferdinand and Katharina's eldest son, John Lang, had arrived a few months earlier. John likely had a sod house under construction near this farmyard. A few years later, he built the main part of this house, which is still occupied to this day. When Ferdinand arrived at Southwest 32, the first tasks involved building a habitable shelter. Ferdinand and his sons were experienced builders, but here there was no lumber. And buying it involved several days of travel by oxen to and from Cupar. So for now, local materials had to do, and that meant building a sod house. Prairie sod was laid around a crude framework of sticks of aspen and the roofs were thatched with slough grass bundles woven into a lattice of sticks. Despite their primitive appearance, we're told sod houses were quite warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Interior walls were usually coated with lime and the floors were initially flattened earth, dirt. Some settlers arriving late in the season possibly simply burrowed into a hillside and added a front wall, 
Well, it's just a hole in the ground, but we call it home. Until the house was finished, we're told Ferdinand and his family first slept under their overturned wagon, and later fashioned poplar poles and the wagon canvas into a large teepee, which they lived in until the house was finished. One wonders if they took any lessons from the curious Cree, who were expert teepee builders. We're told that local Cree people helped several grateful homesteaders survive in those first years. The family brought as many supplies as they could load in their wagon, such as flour and dry goods, as well as a few chickens for eggs and cows for milk. And cows occasionally and likely reluctantly were teamed with oxen as draft animals. So early on, no beef and no pork. But happily, the plains offered a plentiful supply of rabbits, ducks, and grouse, which we called prairie chickens. Settlers reported especially enjoying the huge prairie hare, or jackrabbit, for which they had many recipes, including brining and smoking the meat to preserve it. How about that? Venison graced every table, just as it had a decade earlier in Felicienthal, and as it did for many of us in the decades to come. The first arduous months of homesteading featured back-breaking work for men, women, and children, and when not occupied digging a well, building a house, or hunting game, they harnessed the oxen to start busting the sod. In the early days, a team of oxen pulled a one-bottom plow while a settler walked behind, holding plow handles and the reins while attempting to cut a straight furrow. As soon as possible, most settlers upgraded to horses and a plow with a seat for the driver. Luxury. As 1906 rolled into 1907, John Lang, John Holterman, Bill Lang, Anton Degelman, Wenzel Hoffmeister, and Alloys or Dutchy Lang were settled on their respective quarters with their families. Quarter by quarter, they, along with the Fuchs and the Millers, leaned into their grueling work of earning the patent to their free land. John Wolfe's nephew, Arnold Wunder, was appointed postmaster at Wolfsheim. John Miller managed the local postal delivery, and a collection of farmers petitioned for and received permission to build a school, which they named Wallenstein, after a 15th century Bohemian general, and soon it was filled with Bohemian sodbusters, children and grandchildren, of which, many years later, I was one. The Homestead Acts instituted by democratic governments in Canada and the United States represented a revolutionary approach to colonization. The policy of offering free land to peasants and farmers represented a radical shift from the previous practice of autocratic monarchs granting vast tracts of land to European aristocrats, as was the case in South and Central America where persistent attempts at land reform and redistribution have seen minimal success to date. There, the rich kept the land while the peasants who worked it remained landless. On the Great Plains, however, with hard work and good luck, homesteading farmers created wealth for themselves and their descendants, and aside from continuing work on resolving indigenous land claims, the issue of land reforms was avoided. In the next episode, the Grand Trunk Railroad arrives, Raymore and Quinton are established, and the Bohemian sodbusters brace for a looming war that would pit their old country in deadly combat with the new. Thanks for watching.